everybody. Uh, this is a integrated chemistry and physics lecture for uh, Elena and Jesse and Kirsten and Caleb and uh, Fernando. I hope you guys are having a great uh, day. We are uh, blessed to be together. Uh, I gave you a bell ringer just a few moments ago. Uh, I made a video of, a, of the bell ringer exercise because I'm giving that bell ringer ex exercise to all my classes. I prayed in that bell ringer exercise, but let's go ahead and do a short prayer anyway for our integrated chemistry and physics learning. Heavenly Father, we ask you to give us the desire to uh, teach well the integrated chemistry and physics students and give the students the desire to learn well about chemistry. Give us the desire that we need to do what you want us to do uh, with regard to learning chemistry. We have been, uh, we have been doing a little bit. Um, help us to do all that you want. In your mighty name, Jesus, amen. Okay, so uh, we are, uh, last time I made a integrated chemistry and physics lecture, I went through uh, section one of chapter 16 talking about metals and uh, I'll spend a few minutes here talking about nonmetals, and then we'll start into the standardized practice test uh, and I don't know if I'll finish the standardized practice test for this chapter 16 in this video or not. Uh, if, if I don't I'll make another video to finish the standardized practice test discussions because those are good discussions for us to have. And um, the standardized practice test uh, will be our assessment for chapter 16, is how we'll go with that. So uh, section two of, the, uh, of this chapter talks about the, um, the non-metals, okay, on the periodic table. So looking at the periodic table, I'm going to turn the camera over to the periodic table and uh, the power cord fell off when I turned the, P the uh, laptop or maybe I should have said Chromebook. Okay, so there's the periodic table. Hello everybody. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. You bet. So here, here are the non-metals. Over here the two electrons 
but it only but its outer energy level only can hold two electrons. Neon has eight electrons in its outer energy level and two electrons in its level one energy level, so it has a full outer energy level. Okay, so anyway, that's the noble gases. I, I, they're considered non-metals. So anything that's not a metal is a non-metal. Okay. So we have these non-metal elements uh, in this column. Uh, these elements need one electron to have a full outer energy level. So they are really thirsty for an electron. Really, really, really thirsty. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and AT. Is that antimony? Probably. Something like that. I can't remember what AT is off the top of my head, but you've got a periodic table hopefully there in front of you that you're looking at. If you don't have it, I hope you'll open your ICP book to the back flap where there's a periodic table and the name of AT is on your periodic table. So this is the all of these elements need one electron to have a full outer energy level, just like these noble gases already have. These are non-reactive, these are highly reactive. And these are highly reactive. They want to give up an electron. These don't exist in nature all by themselves. These do not exist in nature all by themselves. Sometimes you'll find bromine gas, but that's Br2. There are two bromine um, atoms that make a diatomic molecule. I'll show you that on the board. Okay. So bromine, even if you have a, a vial of pure bromine, it will not exist as a pure as a single atom. It exists like this: a bromine atom with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven outer energy level electrons uh, will combine with its neighbor, Br. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven outer energy level electrons. So two bromine atoms will share an electron with each other so that each bromine atom can have eight electrons in their outer energy level. That's how it works. That, that they, they want an outer energy level that's full so badly that they run around holding hands in a covalent bond, sharing these two electrons with, with each other so that they can have a full outer energy level or be more like a, a full outer energy level. So bromine, chlorine, uh, fluorine, they all, they all do this with their electron sharing in the outer energy level. If you have a, a glass jar that's full of bromine, that all the bromine will be combined like that. Okay? I guess, I, I guess you can see that. I, I'm glad you can see that. Okay, so we're talking about nonmetals on the periodic table. You guys have your periodic table. Let's talk some more about nonmetals. Okay? Uh, properties of nonmetals. Right? They're, they're not malleable and they're not ductile. Okay? Uh, so, reading a little bit about nonmetals here, they're usually gases um, when they are uh, in nature. Nonmetals are gases an awful lot. Uh, they are sometimes solids, but rarely liquid. Solid nonmetals are not malleable or ductile, but are brittle and powdery. Okay? Nonmetals are poor conductors of heat and electricity. The electrons in nonmetals are not free to move as they do in metals, because the nonmetal wants electrons. Uh, it does not give up its electrons easily. It's not a good conductor. 
for electricity or it's an insulator, if anything. Okay? So they talk about bonding of nonmetals. They talked about the diatomic molecule on page 527. Um, uh, they talk about the, the uh, halogens, which is group, uh, uh, you might call it group 7. Uh, I think on some periodic tables it's called group 17. Um, uh, but there's a, a it, on some periodic tables it's called group 7. On the periodic table in the back of our book, they're called group 17, the halogens. Group 18 are called the noble gases. And group 16, they have a name as well. Anybody want to know? Anybody already know what group 16 uh, nonmetal elements that group is called? Okay, their group 16 is the oxygen group. But nobody's here to answer me, so it was hard to answer that question. So there's the carbon group, if I'm not mistaken. There's the boron group. There's the nitrogen group. I believe it's called the oxygen group. Yeah, the oxygen group is, is uh, group 16. Okay, so they're just taking the element at the top of those particular groups and calling that group by that name. Okay, so there's uh, group 16 is the oxygen group. Group 15 is the nitrogen group. Group 14 is the carbon group. Okay, and... Uh, and there you have it for all the, of course, group uh, 18 is the noble gases and group 17 is the halogens. I'm not sure why the halogens are called the halogens. Not uh, I couldn't say what halogen means in whatever language the, the, uh, the, the people that decided we ought to call this group the halogens. Don't know why they did called it that, okay? So there's a few other words in here uh, for uh, different um, vocab words, but we'll talk about the vocab words when we get to the standardized practice test. Okay? So I am done talking about nonmetals. Um, uh, there was also the transition elements discussed here in, uh, in this chapter. Um, but the, no, they're metals. Transition elements are, are metals, primarily. And then there's also metalloids, which is, um, they have, they have uh, and you know where the metalloids are on the periodic table, and I think it's enough to know that metalloids act, sometimes they act like metals and they give up an electron, uh, to make a chemical reaction, and sometimes they act like nonmetals and they receive electrons from other from metal elements. They'll react with metals and uh, receive an electron from a metal. And they'll no, no they don't act react with nonmetals. They only give up electrons to nonmetals, and they receive electrons from metals, metalloids. Okay, hope that made sense to you. So there's a standardized practice test here I saw. It's on page uh, 546 in your textbook. The standardized test practice, okay? Uh, multiple choice questions. Record your answers in the, on an answer sheet. So let's get, get out an answer sheet and get ready to uh, answer these questions in detail. If I write something on the board, then, of course, the expectation would be that you would also write that down on your, uh, multi on your standardized test practice answer sheet and then turn that in to me so I know that you were paying attention and understood. Feel free to ask questions if you don't understand how we got to a particular answer. No problem with that. You write down the question uh, or email me the question or call me at 317-527-9531 and ask me the question. I hope you're having a great day. Here we go. On page 546, question number one. Standardized practice test. Okay, everybody understand. Page 546. 
Which element is the main component of steel? And the most widely used of all the metals? So your answer, your choices are iron, aluminum, cadmium, or magnesium. Well, I kind of like the answer of iron, don't you? Iron is, is the most prominent element used in steel. It has uh, contaminants that it becomes, it becomes uh, makes iron strong. Iron all by itself is not as strong as steel. What's the other element that we add to iron to make iron into steel? Well, that's carbon, okay? And carbon is, uh, uh, is used uh, as you, it's added to liquid iron. It's a very special process. The steel mill is an incredible process. I recommend to you, if you don't know how a steel mill works, that you get out there on YouTube and you do a search on steel mills, steel mill videos, and go take a look at that. It's incredible. It really is incredible what steel mills do. And I mean, we're talking molten iron. People, people sticking hose and other uh, utensils into the molten iron uh, to, to, before it gets poured out of a vast bucket, uh, into uh, and what happens is uh, the carbon gra uh, the carbon in a pretty much a powdered graphite gets added to the iron molten iron and then the carbon gets incorporated into the molten iron and then when that solidifies the carbon atoms are uh, intrusive in the iron uh, metal matrix causing stiffness Great brittle. It makes it really strong. You can't bend it at all, or it breaks. You, you can break steel, as you know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, it's not complete. I mean, it's not super breakable. It can bend. Have, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody bend steel, like uh, super, our favorite Superman. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Kramer, I wish I had a piece of steel here that I could bend for you right now. I guess um, all I can think of are these glasses that I'm wearing, but I don't want to break my glasses, right? But I could bend those glasses if I chose to, right? Okay, so you understand what I'm getting at. So iron ans is the answer to number one, A, iron. And number two, group one elements are called what? Group one elements, are they, they're called, are they called the alkali metals? Are they called? No, they're not called the transition metals. Group one is not a transition metal. The lanthanides? No, the lanthanides are down on the periodic table uh, at the bottom. Radioactive elements? No, not exactly. Alkali metals? Huh, ah, I like that answer. Alkali metals. That's a good answer. Okay. Uh, what's the group two? That's probably the next question. Uh, well, let's just ask that. What is the group two um, group called? They're called the alkali earth metals. So there's the alkali metals in group one and the alkali earth metals in group two. Okay. What name is given to the three highlighted elements? So what are those three highlighted elements in the picture above question number three? Well, there's iron and cobalt and nickel. And those are called the iron triad. You could find that in, back in your book if you don't believe me. Okay? And that's the answer of multiple choice question is D. That they're called the iron triad. Why are they called the iron triad? Well, as a matter of fact, iron, in addition uh, to adding carbon to iron to make steel, you also can add cobalt or nickel. And that changes the properties of the steel. You know how steel all by itself will rust? Well, if you add the right amount of cobalt and nickel, it greatly increases the resistance of the steel to rust. 
And also there's molybdenum to a very less extent. It's just a trace amount of molybdenum. And now, you, and now in addition to iron and cobalt and nickel and carbon, and you add a little molybdenum, you get what's called stainless steel. And that won't rust. It's pretty cool. That's, you know, you've probably seen that silver metal that's stainless. Almost looks like aluminum, but it's, it's much more dense than aluminum. That's stainless steel. Okay, so molybdenum is another element on the periodic table. You can go ahead and find it. Okay, so that's called the iron triad because those are, those are pretty common even in just plain steel. Number four, to which major group do these elements belong? Okay, so we're talking about iron and cobalt and nickel. That same picture above, question number four, uh, to which major group do these elements belong? Well, that'd be the transition elements, wouldn't it? That's so the answer to number four is C, transition elements, right? Number five, which is a property of the elements that make up more than 95% of the human body by mass? Which is a property of the elements that make up more than 95% of the human body by mass? Okay. Use the graph below to answer questions five and six. So there's this graph. It shows oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, and others. Those are the elements. And the graph is titled, Elements in the Human Body by Percent Mass. Okay? So these elements in the human body by percent mass. So which is a property of the elements that make up more than 95% of the human body by mass? Well, they're non-metals. 95% of the elements in, in the human body are probably oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Let's check that. Oxygen is 66%. Carbon is 18%. So 66% and 18% is, let's see, let's see, 66 and 18 is, 6 and 8 is 14, carry the 1, that's 84%. So that's not 95% yet. So now we'll have to add hydrogen to that, which is 10%, okay, and that becomes 94% and maybe we misread this 18 maybe that should have been 19 and this is a 95 right everybody get that so oxygen carbon and hydrogen together make up 95% of your uh, the mass of your body water is 70% of your body that's hydrogen and oxygen right and then there's also carbon, a lot of carbon in amino acids and proteins and DNA and RNA. Uh, so there's an awful lot of the, uh, I saw on Star Trek one time where the alien intelligence that was asking the uh, Star Trek Enterprise crew, uh, it said, what are the carbon units for on your ship? And everybody looked at each other. <laughs> well, we're unfathomably precious. Who are you? <laughs> Star Trek can be funny. All right, so oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. 95% of our body mass is made up of those three elements in various molecules, bound up as, as various molecules of our bodies. So which is a property of the elements that make up more than 95% of the human body by mass? Is malleability a property? No. Poor, I mean, it's a property, but it's not the property they're looking for. Poor electrical and heat conductivity? Mm, mm, mm. Maybe. That could be it. That's a non-metal trait. Shiny appearance? Well, I see that my, I'm kind of shiny, but I'm standing right here in a bright light. So it, shiny appearance is, 
is really, uh, I don't think oxygen and carbon and hydrogen uh, as elements uh, look shiny so much. Ductility, that would be a metal, wouldn't it? Ductility. So maybe, we, and malleability would be a metal also. So maybe we ought to go with the best answer of B, poor electrical and heat conductivity. That's a trait of a non-metal, okay? And we've got oxygen and carbon as the two major elements that make up our bodies, and then hydrogen brings it up to 95%, okay? Number six, which element listed in the graph is a metal? Which element listed in the graph is a metal? Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, or others? Well, let's see. You've got, you got to look all those up on the periodic table if you don't know right off the top of your head. Uh, calcium, I happen to know, is in the alkali earth metal group. Uh, I know calcium is because I've done an awful lot of... Uh, chemical reaction balancing. I've done an awful lot of talking about calcium. As an engineer, you have to deal with calcium oxide in your city water supply to your manufacturing plant because calcium will ruin uh, uh, various aspects of your, um, of your uh, food plant or pharmaceutical plant or whatever. Uh, and so you have to purify water, and calcium is one of the things that's in all kinds of water. Calcium uh, oxide uh, is, is very much involved in uh, limestone, okay? Calcium carbonate also. So you, you end up, in, the earth has an awful lot of calcium in it, and when you're getting water out of the earth, you have to clean the calcium out of the water. And that's what water softeners do. I don't know if, if you live in a home with a water softener. Uh, you probably live here in Greenwood, Indiana, which has a water distribution system. Uh, I don't know if they soften the water here in Greenwood, which calcium would be a hardness element. Calcium is considered a hardness element that is removed by a water softener that removes the calcium from dissolved in the water, and replaces it with a sodium ion, as a matter of fact, in a water softener. If you want to learn more about that, I'm sure there's a YouTube video that talks about softening hard water that you can look up and, and see. It's beautiful, just beautiful. All right, so which element listed in the graph is a metal? Uh, calcium is. That's The answer is D. Which element is present in all organic compounds? Okay, which element is present in all organic compounds? You guys remember that from reading this chapter uh, or outlining this chapter? Anybody, anybody know the answer? Anybody? Anybody? I love you guys. I'll go ahead and proceed now that I've bored you to death with that anybody, anybody joke. Carbon. Carbon is in all organic compounds compounds. Organic compounds include carbon. If a compound does not include carbon, it is not an organic compound. That's the definition of organic compounds. Compounds that include carbon. Now what's a compound? A compound is something that has more than one, uh, more than one atom. Here's this, this is considered an element and a compound because uh, it only has bromine in it, but it's also got a covalent bond. So let's talk about calcium oxide. Calcium, I hope you can see this well, calcium has two electrons in its outer energy level. So I'm going to put them right here. They're both in the S in the 2s orbital. These two electrons are in the 2s orbital, okay? And this calcium with these two electrons in its outer energy level is, is combined to oxygen, let's say. Calcium oxide. This is hardness. This is limestone, okay? 
This is hardness. So this oxygen atom has two electrons, and then it, ha it actually has six electrons in its outer energy level. If you look at the, if you look at the uh, periodic table, you'll see that oxygen is over there in group 16. And if you look across, if you count from lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen across the periodic table, uh, you see that it has six electrons in its outer energy level. And so these calcium electrons and these, these oxygen electrons are shared between calcium and oxygen, okay? Uh, if you put calcium oxide in water, some of it will dissolve in water, and you'll end up with a calcium ion of 2 plus and an oxygen ion of 2 minus, okay? But it really doesn't dissolve in water very well. Calcium oxide doesn't actually dissolve. This, this uh, uh, is, uh, uh, breaks away mechanically from limestone, and you end up with calcium oxide molecules in the water that will actually precipitate in piping. Uh, they, make, they make recipes. When you're making food with water, calcium oxide will make the, res the final recipe not taste very good. Um, you don't want to inject calcium oxide into uh, uh, like a vaccine. You would need pure water to make a vaccine with, you know, an injectable medicine. Okay, so calcium oxide is not wanted in a lot of cases, and so this has to be removed. And this gets removed because this is very, this side, the, po the center of positive charge on this molecule is here, and the center of negative charge on this molecule is here because oxygen keeps these two electrons over here a lot more than calcium keep, uh, keeps these two electrons with it. So this is the center of positive charge, that's the center of negative charge, and so calcium oxide can get removed in a water softener and replaced with sodium ion, okay? Yeah, I, I recommend that you learn how a softener works. All right, if you do, by the way, if you do it, there's bonus points for you, it, depending on how well you do it. If, if you go, and discover how a water softener works and explain it to me in an essay with a diagram or two, uh, I will give you, uh, I will give you uh, bonus points for that. Okay, so what else? I think we just got done doing number six. Um, no, we just got done doing number seven, talking about carbon. Which element is present in all organic compounds? Carbon. Which is not a property of the transuranium elements? Okay, transuranium elements. Those are the elements that are larger in atomic number than uranium. And uranium's atomic number, if you look it up, is 92. And uh, look at the periodic table and go to the right of, of uranium on the periodic table with atomic number of 92 move your finger to the right on the periodic table, those are transuranium elements. So anything with an atomic number of greater than 92 on the periodic table is a transuranium element, okay? So which is not a property of a transuranium element? Does it occur naturally? No, there's no elements. You can't walk up anywhere on Earth and pick up a chunk of a transuranium element. It does not exist naturally. So it does not, so that's not a property of transuranium elements. Have greater than 92 protons. Boy, that sounds really good. I bet that's the right answer. Let's see what the other two answers choices are. Are synthetic. Well, if, if it exists for a very short amount of time in a lab, I would think you could call that a synthetic element. Uh, synthetic being man-made. But uh, So B and C are pretty good answers both, but I like B better. 
are unstable. All the transuranium elements are unstable. Hmm, that sounds right also. Because if you have a transuranium element and it stops being a transuranium element because it throws off alpha particles and it's radioactive, etc., that's an unstable, I would call that an unstable element. So B, C, and D seem like good answers. Oh, it's, it's not which is a property of a transuranium element. It, should, it says which is not a property of the transuranium elements. Look at that question. You see that? So now we know the answer is A. It occurs naturally because it doesn't occur naturally. I love you guys. Okay, so is that enough for this video? Let's go with that's enough for this video. And I'll, I'll answer the other questions, 9 through 20, on a, a, a future video. Boy, I really have appreciated you guys paying attention to me, assuming that you have. Uh, I'm going to go forward now, and um, uh, I, I, I wish a blessing on each of you. Uh, dear Lord, bless my students. Bless my students uh, in a way that is pleasing to you. Give them everything that you want to give them today. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys. Have a great one.